What's up my friend, Abby here and welcome back to Writer's Life Wednesdays where we come together to help you make your story matter and make your author dreams come true. Today we are talking about writing the first plot point of your story. So if you've been here for a while, you know that we're doing a video series breaking down in detail the three act story structure. We already explored writing a gripping opening hook and a mind-blowing inciting incident. Plus, I also did a video case studying real inciting incidents from stories. So check out all of those videos to get up to speed. The links are in the description box below, and then come back to this video because you need to write a killer hook and inciting incident in order to pull readers into your story and bring them to the first plot point. If you've already been watching the series and you're ready for the next step, Awesome. That's what today's video is all about. We're going to be unpacking the elusive first plot point, which is essentially the first important decision that your protagonist makes, which then determines what happens next. We're not just going to talk about writing in characters though. We're going to go beyond that and explore the science behind how the human brain makes painful decisions. Why does your story matter? Good question. What if I told you that there's a science behind every great story? I don't just teach you how to write. I teach you how to change the world with your story and make your author dreams come true. Remember how we talked about the impossible choice in the inciting incident video? The hook is what set up your protagonist's internal conflict and drew the comfort zone, your protagonist's comfort zone. And then the inciting incident stepped in, pushed them outside their comfort zone, and then forced them to make a choice, a difficult choice an impossible choice. The first plot point is when your protagonist makes that choice. Let's read it from the three act story structure template, which is linked in the description box below, by the way. So grab your copy and follow along. First plot point, protagonist makes a decision which determines what happens next. Your protagonist is a conflicted person torn between desire and fear. So when the inciting incident steps in and shoves them outside their comfort zone, their fear takes over and they respond based on that misbelief, which sets up more obstacles for the rest of the book. The human brain makes decisions by avoiding the most pain. So what is the least painful option in the long run? Venturing into the unknown and risking some danger, but ultimately getting what you have always desired. Prompt, ask yourself, how is my protagonist going to react to the inciting incident given their fear and misbelief about the world? What decision are they going to make now to avoid the most pain and get what they want while steering clear of the thing they're afraid of? Okay, so in order for me to take you deeper into this, we first have to talk about how the human brain makes decisions. Whether you realize it or not, your brain is constantly making decisions, okay? Every day, every hour, every minute, every second, your brain is sifting through hundreds of possible choices and deciding on one course of action. Our lives parallel and intersect with each other based on the specific set of choices we make, and although it may seem like just a random assortment of events that create this chaos called life, there is actually a method to our madness. And that method is what I like to call pain versus pain. What if I told you that every single decision you ever made was to avoid the most pain? Even when you thought you were doing the harder thing, you actually weren't doing the harder thing. You were merely rewriting the definition of pain in your mind. Let's use an example that we're all familiar with, waking up in the morning. Let's say you have to get up at 4 a.m. because you need to catch a flight that leaves at seven. It takes you an hour to get ready, 30 minutes to drive to the airport, and you like to be through TSA at least one hour before your plane takes off. So you set your alarm for 4.30 because that gives you two and a half hours, just the amount of time that you need, right? Well, when that alarm rings at 4.30, you don't want to get up. Your bed feels so soft and warm and comfortable and you're tired and it's still dark out. Why would you want to get up when it's still dark out? The thought of getting up is literally painful. So you hit the snooze button. You don't need a whole hour to get ready anyway, right? The pain of giving yourself a little bit less time to get ready is not as painful as the pain of getting out of bed right now. So 
you sleep a little bit more. And then the alarm rings again. You still don't wanna get up because it's still dark out and you're still tired and your bed is still really comfy and the thought of getting up is still really painful. So you hit the snooze button again because you don't need that much time to go find your gate anyway, right? I mean, last time your flight was delayed and you had to sit there for like 20 extra minutes anyway. So you can sleep more, you have time, so you sleep more. Because the pain of running through the airport to find your gate is still not as painful as the thought of getting out of bed right now. But then the alarm rings again and <gasps> it's 5 a.m. Now you only have two hours to get ready, drive to the airport, get through TSA, find your gate and get on your plane. 30 minutes less than what you needed, which means now you're running late and there's a possibility that you could miss your flight. So you finally shut off your alarm and jump out of bed, hurrying to get ready. Why? Because the pain of missing your flight is greater than the pain of getting out of bed. But here's the thing, the feeling of getting out of bed did not change, only your perception of it did. Because you started comparing it to the pain of something more significant, missing your flight. All that time, whether you were conscious of it or not, you were comparing the pain of getting out of bed with the pain of other unpleasant things like rushing to get ready and sprinting through the airport to find your gate. But finally, there was a tipping point when you realized that the pain of not getting out of bed was actually greater than the pain of getting out of bed. So you got out of bed. Most of this comparison decision-making happens backstage in our minds. It happens in the subconscious mind. Most of the time without us even noticing. Our brain is hardwired to avoid pain, which makes sense because it's a survival skill. Okay, you avoid pain, you avoid danger, you live longer. It's a very basic primal psychological tool that usually works in our favor, but it doesn't always work in our favor because it fosters our brain's default path of least resistance program. And that's when you need to take the steering wheel and say, hey, I need to do the harder thing because I know it's the right thing to do. But here's the freaky part. Your brain literally won't allow you to do the harder thing. It's built to avoid pain. And that's why you have to consciously rewrite your definition of pain. Let's take, for example, the most extreme military training in the world, the US Navy SEALs. When you hear about the totally insane physical and mental tests that a person must pass to become a Navy SEAL, it almost seems impossible. The most infamous part of SEAL training training is called Hell Week, and it's designed to push you beyond your limits and see if you can endure under extreme physical pain and exhaustion. Never mind having to get out of bed at 4.30 to catch your flight, recruits are only allowed four hours of sleep for the entire week. It's called hell for a reason. Which raises the question, why would anyone want to put themselves through actual hell to be a Navy SEAL? Aha, the answer is in the question, why? Everyone who graduates from the Navy SEAL program must know the answer to that question before they even enter the program. They have to know why they are personally driven to become a Navy SEAL, otherwise they won't even make it through first phase. Because in order to make the decision to put yourself through hell, you have to have a very clear reason why this matters so much to you. You have to have a reason so incredibly persuasive that it now becomes more painful to ring that bell and quit the training than it is to go through hell week. So yes, you can choose to do the harder thing, but only after you redefine pain in your mind. You have to make the harder thing less painful by foreseeing the outcome of not doing the harder thing. So what does all of this mean for story? That's a great question. <laughs> Just kidding. If you want your characters to seem human, they have to respond to difficult decisions the same way humans do. Okay, they have to experience this conflict of pain versus pain. When the inciting incident shoves them outside their comfort zone, they have to face this impossible choice. Stay inside my comfort zone and risk never getting what I desire or venture into the unknown and accomplish my goal while still avoiding my fear. We know they're not gonna stay inside their comfort zone because that would mean there's no story. <laughs> the plot is what forces your characters to change, 
but they have to decide how they're going to respond to the plot, otherwise they're just a proverbial punching bag. So we know that they're going to venture into the unknown, and they're going to try to accomplish their goal while still trying to steer clear of the thing that they're afraid of. Because as they're weighing these options here, they realize the less painful thing long term is actually to venture into the unknown, venture further outside my comfort zone, and maybe experience some risk and danger but ultimately get the thing that I've always wanted. So even though it might seem more immediately uncomfortable, it's more ultimately rewarding. So they make the decision and they step outside their comfort zone. And because the reader understands this comfort zone and knows what it means for the character to step outside of it, now, oh my gosh, we are pulled right in and we are desperate to know what's gonna happen next. You might already be seeing how this is going to apply to your story, but just in case it's a little bit fuzzy still, I wanna show you some examples for mill stories. Okay, I have two examples today. They're both good examples because I kind of already did like the bad example of the inciting incident um, or like a lack of an impossible choice and if you didn't see that video check it out right here but first up for the good example of a first plot point we have Sense and Sensibility by Jane Austen. It's really amazing actually how much this story follows the three act story structure. I was noticing that last time I rewatched the BBC adaptation best version by the way. <laughs> the hook and the inciting incident show up pretty fast. John Dashwood dies, leaving his wife and three daughters nothing because laws of the time forced every penny of inheritance to go to the son in the family who happens to be a half-brother who happens to be a jerk. His wife is even worse, and when the two of them move in with the Dashwoods immediately after their father's death, let's just say it pushes everyone outside their comfort zone. <laughs> Conflict and angst abound as the Dashwood girls try to cope with the death of their father and their witchy sister-in-law who makes it very clear that they are not welcome in their own house. This forces Mrs. Dashwood and the girls to make a decision. They need to find a new place to live, but they can't afford the kind of house they're used to. Finally, they find a cottage by the sea and decide to take it, not because it's particularly appealing, but because it's less painful than living with their spiteful relatives who more or less wish them dead. Mrs. Dashwood reaches a breaking point when she can't take it any longer. She snaps up the offer of the cottage because even though it's going to be nothing like the luxury she's used to, it's less painful than staying in her posh yet conflicted home. The decision to move is the first plot point of Sense and Sensibility because it sets up literally everything else that's going to happen. That's what I'm talking about, okay? Pain versus pain. One more great example because I can't help myself. <sighs> Pull dark. This is not even a book. It's the screenplay for the show. And I've talked about this show <laughs> before, but not nearly enough. Seriously, it's one of the best, most gripping story openings that I've ever seen. Ross Poldark gets one hell of an inciting incident. After he's wounded in the Revolutionary War, he returns home to Cornwall only to find his father dead, his estate in ruins and debt, and his one true love engaged to marry his cousin because she thought Ross died in the war. Needless to say, this is kind of a rude awakening for Ross, and it would be for anyone. But as we get to know Ross, we see how these events push him outside his comfort zone. We learn that he has a deeply rooted fear of being controlled. We see it in his tongue-in-cheek attitude toward the law and government, and the way he rolls up his sleeves and gets stuff done instead of complaining about it or begging others for help. He snubs polite society and would rather break a jail than go to a party any day of the week. The first plot point shows up for Ross after the inciting incident. He's been sufficiently pushed outside his comfort zone, especially after Elizabeth marries his cousin Francis. Still struggling with debt and his inner conflict, Ross's uncle offers to send him away with a bunch of money to start afresh in London or basically anywhere away from Elizabeth. But Ross struggles with this choice. Leaving Cornwall would mean escaping his present pain and torment, but it would also mean abandoning his friends and the mine he wants to reopen. It would mean turning his back on everything he values, and that just doesn't sit right with Ross. So finally, after some floundering indecision, he decides to stay, because staying and facing his struggles at home is actually less painful than the idea of leaving his friends and family behind. It seems like the more right and heroic thing to do, and Ross is definitely a heroic character, 
but he's also very human and the first plot point makes sense because we see what he values and how he arrives at this pivotal choice. Okay, so that is what the first plot point looks like and by now you're probably thinking of like a hundred other different examples of first plot points in other stories. So definitely comment below right now and tell me what is your favorite example of a well done first plot point. Now let's recap everything we learned about the first plot point today. The first plot point is the moment your protagonist makes the impossible choice, which determines what happens next. Remember to show your reader why this impossible choice is so difficult for your protagonist to face because of her desire, fear, and misbelief. The human brain makes decisions based on avoiding pain. Even when you think you're doing the harder thing, you are actually just rewriting the definition of pain in your mind. There comes a tipping point when inaction is more painful than action, even if the action is extremely painful. That being said, your protagonist is primed to make a decision based on her misbelief. She can stay inside her comfort zone and risk never getting what she desires, or she can venture into the unknown and accomplish her goal while still avoiding her fear. Upon consideration and redefining pain in her mind, your protagonist will realize that the second option is more rewarding in the long run. Ask yourself, how is my protagonist going to react to the inciting incident given their fear and misbelief about the world? What decision are they going to make now to avoid the most pain and get what they want while still steering clear of the thing they're afraid of? Okay, boom, that's the first plot point and we're getting really close to wrapping up act one of your story or the first third of your story. But before we close out the first act, there's one more thing that really kicks your story up a notch and that is the first pinch point. What the heck even is a pinch point? We're going to talk about that next time, how to add that little sprinkle of impending doom and suspense to hook your readers even more. And of course, we'll talk about the human brain on danger. So that's coming at you the week after next. And if you're from the future, the link will be right there. Smash that like button if you liked this video and be sure to subscribe to this channel if you haven't already, because I post writing videos and publishing videos every single Wednesday. And I would love to have you here in the community. Also, be sure to check out my Patreon because that's where we go beyond videos and take storytelling to the next level, okay? The Patreon community is not only the best way to support what I'm doing here on YouTube, but it's also the only way to connect one-on-one -on -one with me and get better guidance on your story. So go to patreon.com slash Abby Emmons and check out all the awesome extra exclusive bonus content that I have over there for you. Until next week, my friend, rock on. And there's a possibility that you could miss your flight. Maybe I shouldn't have used a plane metaphor because they're just like plane after plane after plane flying over this house right now. So I'm I love airplanes. I love all kinds of aircraft, but I just wish they wouldn't fly over my house when I'm filming a video. That's all I ask. That is all I ask.